Welcome, everyone. We're getting ready to start. Uh, and it is my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for today. Uh, and the talk today is one of the inaugural events for our new center at the Duke Law School for International Comparative Law. And if you haven't uh, looked at it already, uh, you may want to uh, sometime later take a look at our website on the, for the center that's now on the Duke Law website. It describes a number of the upcoming uh, programs that we have planned for the Duke Law School community uh, for this year and describes a variety of the resources that law school has or is developing in the international comparative law area. Uh, one of our uh, very significant inaugural events is the talk today, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mr. John Bellinger. Uh, Mr. Bellinger is currently the legal advisor at the U.S. State Department. Um, in that capacity, he's the principal advisor uh, on all domestic and international law matters to the entire Department of State, as well as the Foreign Service and the U.S. diplomatic and consular posts abroad. He's also the principal legal advisor on matters relating to the conduct of U.S. foreign relations to other executive branch agencies and through the Secretary of State to the uh, White House and uh, including the National Security Council. Prior to becoming the legal advisor uh, in April of 2005, Mr. Bellinger already had a long and distinguished career in government service, holding a, a variety of different positions throughout the government. Uh, they include senior advisor to the Secretary of State, legal advisor to the National Security Council, senior associate counsel to the President, counsel for national security matters in the criminal division of the U.S. Justice Department, counsel to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, general counsel to the Commission on the Roles and Capabilities of the U.S. Intelligence Community, and special assistant to the Director of Central Intelligence. And prior to government service, uh, he practiced law for several years at Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering in Washington, D.C. Mr. Bellinger received his bachelor's degree from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and his law degree from Harvard Law School. He also received a master's degree in foreign affairs from the University of Virginia. As legal advisor to the Secretary of State, Mr. Bellinger has had to address a host of controversial issues, including issues relating to U.S. policies in the war on terrorism, and he has already become known and applauded for his candor, his constructive diplomacy, and his frequent reaffirmation, often to very skeptical audiences, of the U.S. commitment to international law. Today, Mr. Bellinger will be speaking to us about transatlantic approaches to international law and institutions. John Bellinger. Uh, thanks, Kurt, and thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I have never been to Duke before. It's something that I have long wanted to do. I will tell you I have had a, a secret grudge against Duke because for all of my time at the White House, my principal deputy was a Duke graduate. Uh, and for a week in March every year, he would absolutely disappear. Uh, and then I had to do all the work. Uh, so uh, I am delighted to see that most of you have not painted yourselves blue. Uh, but uh, uh, nonetheless, I, really, I, am, I am really uh, happy to be here. Uh, I hope you all know what a treasure you have in Kurt Bradley. I know he is relatively new to the faculty here, uh, but uh, has served as counselor on international law to my predecessor as legal advisor at the State Department, uh, Will Taft. Uh, the legal advisors at the State Department for many years have brought in, generally from academe, uh, a, a distinguished professor of international or constitutional law to help bring an outside perspective so that we don't get caught in our own little governmental ivory tower. Uh, and although Kurt had just left by the time I became legal advisor, I, can, I worked with him closely when I was at the White House. He was deeply, deeply respected by Will Taft. Uh, and by everybody in the U.S. government and really brought a tremendous perspective from the outside uh, and particularly working closely with the Justice Department on international and national security issues. So I hope if you've not had a chance to sit down with Kurt, he will tell you some of his uh, war stories. Uh, and they really are real war stories, so uh, I, I, I hope you will do that. He's, he's terrific, a great asset to you uh, here at Duke. Uh, today, I would like to take advantage uh, of the uh, inauguration of your new Center on International and Comparative Law uh, to talk a little bit about the work that we do every day at the State Department, 
uh, and its intersection with the important uh, topics that the center will look into. I am delighted uh, that uh, Duke has set up this center with the support of uh, Dean Bartlett, uh, Kurt's work, uh, and uh, I think this is something that's really will be quite helpful to us in government. We'll be educating, uh, I hope, generations of people interested in international and comparative law. So uh, the fact that I am uh, today in the company of students and scholars will give me uh, the opportunity to talk about some of the things I've been doing as legal advisor uh, during the past year and to put some of those things in perspective. Uh, as some of you may know, as Kurt alluded to, uh, for the last 12 months on behalf of Secretary Rice, I've been engaged in an intensive dialogue with our European partners on some of the most contentious and misunderstood issues of the day, namely our counterterrorism laws and policies, especially those relating to the detention, questioning, and transfer of members of Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Those discussions have not always been easy, but I believe that we have made headway in explaining to our European partners our laws and policies including recent legal developments, such as the new Department of Defense detention and interrogation policies. When I began this dialogue a year ago, I felt that our disagreements did not reflect a growing transatlantic divide. I still believe that, and I still think that many of our so-called differences are rooted in misunderstandings. But I've also come to believe that some of our differences are deeper and more complex than generally acknowledged. George Bernard Shaw famously said that the United States and England are two countries divided by a common language. There are times when observers could be forgiven for wondering whether the United States and Europe are two cultures divided by a common system of international law. Reading the headlines, one would think that we have profoundly different, perhaps even irreconcilable, visions of international law and international legal order. But how do you square this with our long-standing and shared traditions of rule of law and respect for law? Or the network of treaties and institutions and regimes that bind us and through which we work and cooperate successfully on a daily basis. Or the fact that the international legal framework that exists today was one that the United States, with its European allies, was instrumental in creating. The plain fact is that we have more in common than not. But this is sometimes forgotten, and our differences are distorted or magnified in ways that prevent, rather than promote, mutual understanding. Why is that? A somewhat glib explanation might be that this is the narcissism of minor differences at work. This was a term that was coined by Freud that describes the phenomenon of fundamentally similar peoples who seize upon their minor differences, exaggerating them to the point of caricature or conflict. There may be some truth there, but if you look at the issues that have been the most divisive, they are primarily in the high stakes, emotionally fraught field of combating transnational terrorism. Thus, in the larger scheme, they may be minor differences, but they are not differences on minor issues. What troubles me deeply, however, about the discussion of transatlantic differences is the conclusion that is sometimes drawn that the United States unlike its European partners, does not take international law seriously. This is patently wrong, and it's dangerous. Having differences is normal and natural, but turning them into something that they are not, a cartoonish picture of the United States as an international actor that cares only about power, not law, erodes trust and impedes dialogue. Because this issue is so important, I want to take a moment to address it before offering some thoughts on the nature and source of transatlantic differences and misunderstandings. And then I'll discuss in greater detail a few areas in which such differences have surfaced. 
The U.S. government believes that international law matters. The seriousness with which we take international law is evident in both our approach to its making and in our commitment to the resulting obligations. It's also reflected in our record of leadership on issues where international action is not merely desired, but is truly required. The irony is that this very seriousness can sometimes work against us. Let me illustrate. Because we take our international obligations seriously, we do not enter into them lightly. In negotiations, my lawyers at the State Department and I push for clarity of language. Congress and the public need to know what we are signing up to. Unfortunately, our efforts to fend off fudged language are sometimes criticized as obstructionist or as attempts to block consensus. In addition, we will not join a treaty until that we know that we can implement it. In some cases, it proves difficult or impossible to get implementing legislation, even when we are already substantially compliant with the obligations that a treaty would impose. Contrast this with many countries that join first and then tackle implementation later, an approach particularly common in the fields of international environmental and human rights law. The result is that the United States can look like a laggard or a malingerer in these important areas, reluctant to make an international commitment. But ironically, in such cases, we take a bigger reputational hit than those countries that join, but then later utterly fail to comply. Compliance issues just do not lend themselves so readily to the soundbite. A related issue is our greater reluctance to sign up to a treaty simply to join consensus or set international standards especially when we need to ignore well-founded concerns in order to do so. This can cost us, particularly when the treaty is or seems to be on a feel-good topic. For example, we've recently taken an international drubbing over the UNESCO Cultural Diversity Convention. We're accused of being against culture, against diversity, and against treaties. But this is nonsensical. The United States is one of the most multi multicultural nations on the planet. The convention, however, reflects the efforts of some countries to engage in protectionist behavior under the guise of diversity. Its ambiguous language can be read to permit the imposition of restrictive trade measures on goods and services as cultural, including books, newspapers, magazines, and even internet websites. This could subvert other international mechanisms, such as the WTO, and could, by hindering the free flow of information, raise human rights concerns. And it's also inconsistent with the values embodied in our First Amendment. Failure to join a treaty regime, however, ah, the lights have gone out. <laughs> Thank you. Not a statement on my talk, <laughs> but I will use the opportunity to grab a drink. Failure to join a treaty regime, however, should not be equated with a lack of respect for international law, nor should it be viewed as a lack of concern for the underlying substantive issue. There are more ways than one to demonstrate commitment. Another example is the case of the recently concluded United Nations Disability Treaty. We participated actively in the drafting and provided advice, but we do not intend to become a party. Our basic position, stemming in part from our experience with the Americans with Disabilities Act, is that the best way to improve the life of the world's disabled is for countries to concentrate on their own domestic legal frameworks. In contrast, on difficult issues that clearly do require international action, the United States has for years been a leader. Consider one example. When the United States adopted the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in 1977, 
no other developed nation was willing to treat the bribery of foreign government officials by businesses as an impediment to international development and commerce. U.S. companies complained bitterly that our principled stand left them at a competitive disadvantage and pointed out that for some European companies, such bribes were not only not illegal, but actually were tax deductible as bribes. A quarter century of U.S. leadership, however, has led to both the OECD Convention on Combating Bribery of Foreign Government Officials and the UN Convention Against Corruption. Without this leadership from the United States, it's doubtful that we would now have these international regimes that serve the public interest in good government and transparency. Before moving on, I want to briefly raise one last issue. The perception that the US government not only fails to take international law seriously, but that we believe that we can ignore it altogether. To some extent, this view has reached the public consciousness through a narrow academic debate regarding the relationship between our Constitution and international law. And it's sometimes recast like this. The United States, unlike many European countries willing to subordinate themselves to international law, places our Constitution above all else and believes that presidential power reigns supreme. But this is simply not true. International law can form a part of our national law. In fact, the Constitution has the effect of incorporating treaties into US law, and it's thus silly to assert, as some have, that the United States believes that treaties are not binding on us. On the contrary, we certainly do recognize that they are binding on us. The Constitution also authorizes Congress to implement the law of nations, what we now call customary international law. And in these situations, compliance with international law becomes a matter of US domestic law. Now, the issues that I've just discussed highlight some general differences in approaches to international law, and so are a good jumping off point to a more specific discussion of transatlantic differences and misunderstandings. The United States and some of its European allies do have a number of differences on international law on a variety of levels, interpretive, substantive, institutional or process related, philosophical. But in this past year, I've realized that a surprising number of our so-called differences are not only overblown, but are erroneous, the product of faulty premises or shoddy analysis. For example, often what is billed as a legal difference is really a difference in policy. This type of mistake crops up with the issue of detainee status, which I will discuss in a moment. People also regularly fall into the classic comparative law trap of contrasting an idealized, idealized version of their own legal system with the failures or aberrations of the foreign system and then extrapolate a set of conclusions. This is made all too easy by the natural asymmetry in information where impressions of foreign systems are formed primarily by news accounts. Take Abu Ghraib, the abhorrent incidents of abuse by detainees or of detainees by US personnel created the perception in the minds of some that the US condones torture. Repugnant and unlawful behavior becomes, in some minds, representative of US policy. The United States, however, has taken steps to prosecute and punish such illegal behavior as well as to clarify international standards. For example, by adopting the new Defense Department detention and interrogation policies, and more recently, the Military Commissions Act. Such issues aside, many of our differences and misunderstandings can be traced to our distinct historical experiences and our legal cultures, traditions, and systems. Our respective milieus have shaped not only our approaches and attitudes to international law, but our expectations of what international law can and should do. 
our radically different experience of World War II goes some way towards explaining our respective approaches to international law. The United States emerged from the war with a pride in nation and an unshaken faith in our institutions of democratic self-governance. For us, international law remained primarily a way to order relations among essentially self-reliant states. In contrast, many European countries were scarred by their experience with nationalism and popular politics. They lost confidence in the ability of national government to protect them, not just from neighboring countries, but from their own worst selves. Some looked to international law as a greater good, a way to constrain some of the forces that had wreaked such havoc. These different experiences may help explain why Europeans appear more eager to legalize or judicialize international issues, even at the expense of domestic self-government, whereas Americans are more comfortable allowing issues to be sorted in the fields of politics or international relations. Our international, our, our legal traditions and cultures have also affected how we engage on international legal issues. I'm overstating and simplifying complex issues, but there's a core of truth in the notion that our common law tradition and legal and political culture incline us to pragmatism and skepticism. We probe the purpose and function of law, examine it, through the lenses of other disciplines, such as economics and sociology, weigh its costs against its benefits, test its flexibility against the facts at hand, judge its value by its effectiveness, and seek where we can an equitable solution. We also have a tendency to approach legal solutions via the virtues that have been drummed into us. The proper starting point is a live case or controversy not an abstract one. The issue must have reached a certain level of ripeness, and the solution should be narrowly tailored to survive the test of future fact patterns and possible challenge through the political process. When we bring this pragmatic, problem-oriented approach to the international arena, our partners who are steeped in continental legal and political traditions look at us askance. They are the products of a tradition premised upon respect for abstract general principles and a rigorous and consistent application of a codified set of comprehensive rules. Their commitment to this approach is not merely intellectual. They see the peace, prosperity, and respect for human rights that Europe has developed since World War II as resting on this approach to international law. To them, our approach can appear opportunistic or worse, self-serving. In turn, we are sometimes taken aback by what we see among certain Europeans as an excessive formalism, a doctrinal inflexibility, and an unwillingness to acknowledge that different paths may lead to the same end. Our problem-oriented approach also predisposes us to distinguish between issues that we believe lend themselves to an international legal resolution and those that do not. This can be at odds with a European tendency heightened by experience with the European Union to see the ideal international legal framework as one that is comprehensive and cohesive, that covers the field. Europeans are more likely than we are to try to fill perceived gaps in the international framework and to promote a synthetic, self-regulating international legal system. To us, this can look like an almost unquenchable, unquenchable desire for more law and more process, a, a desire that is particularly mystifying when it comes at the expense of domestic self-government. And finally, there is an important set of differences arising out of the relationships between international and domestic legal systems. I'll touch on just one, a key one. The soon to be 27 members of the European Union accept the role of an international tribunal, the European Court of Justice, 
as the final arbiter of questions of European law that have direct effect in their domestic law. Those countries and the other 19 members of the Council of Europe also defer to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. And domestic legislation in some countries gives direct effect to the decisions of that court. In the United States, in contrast, a debate exists as to whether our government has the authority to delegate to international tribunals the power to decide questions of international law that would have direct effect in our domestic law. But let me turn to some concrete examples to examine in more detail how some transatlantic differences, imagined and real, misapprehended and not, play out. <coughs> the International Criminal Court. The ICC is a fitting place to start because our decision to unsign the Rome Statute, that is, to notify the United Nations as a depository of the Rome Statute, that we do not intend to become a party, sparked accusations of unilateralism and helped foster a view of the United States that has haunted subsequent actions and decisions. Indeed, the story is sometimes framed as that of a superpower unwilling to accept any fetters on its freedom to act. In this story, we are contrasted to the Europeans who, the better international citizens, are more willing to abide by international rules and submit their issues to international adjudication. The story is easy to tell and simple to grasp, in part because it fits so nicely into a certain set of preconceived notions, but it happens not to be true. We share with the parties to the Rome Statute commitment to ensuring accountability for genocide, for war crimes, and for crimes against humanity. Our record is strong and clear, from Nuremberg to our unwavering political and financial support for the UN tribunals established to prosecute crimes committed in the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, and most recently in Lebanon. What we disagree with is the ICC's method for achieving accountability. Our concerns are not frivolous, although to those who are products of different traditions, these concerns may not be immediately convincing. It's a deeply held American belief that power needs to be checked and public actors need to be held accountable. From the U.S. perspective, the ICC lacks necessary checks and balances, in part because the Rome Statute gives the ICC prosecutor the ability to initiate cases without appropriate oversight by the UN Security Council, creating an undue risk of politicized prosecutions. And we also object on principle to the ICC's claim of jurisdiction over persons from non-party states like the United States. It's because of these and other flaws that we were unable to become a party to the Rome Statute. Should we have done so despite these concerns? Would that have reflected a deeper commitment to the rule of law and proved to us to be better international citizens? Some may think so, but I disagree. In fact, reaching back to a point I made previously, I think our actions show the opposite, how seriously we do take our international legal obligations and international law. Embracing the Rome Statute in spite of our serious legal concerns could only reflect a cavalier attitude towards the court and international law more generally. Is this approach utterly at odds with that of other countries? Not really. It's natural for states to weigh the pros and cons of a particular action and make their choices accordingly. For example, we've not signed up to the ICC, but we have submitted ourselves to the jurisdiction of other adjudicative or arbitral bodies, such as the World Trade Organization and the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal. In the context of the International Court of Justice, we do not accept the court's compulsory jurisdiction, but are not alone in this respect. Several major European powers have not. For example, France, Germany, and Italy. In fact, only one of the five permanent members of the Security Council has done so, the United Kingdom and that with a number of reservations. 
And I also don't think that our decision on the ICC reflects a gap in values with the Europeans. We were weighing the same principles and considerations. We just reached a different policy result. We were deeply concerned about good process, institutional design, and the principle of political accountability. But our decision was in no way a vote for impunity. We were confident that our domestic system was capable of prosecuting and punishing our citizens for these crimes. Now, on a different issue, the unfortunate image of the United States as unwilling to be bound by rules has spilled over into other areas, particularly in the field of the laws of war or international humanitarian law. Take the issue of whether the United States was wrong not to give prisoner of war status to people we picked up on the battlefields in Afghanistan. This is a subject on which there can be an honest policy disagreement. However, it's wrong to say, as I have heard many times in Europe, that there was no legal basis for our detention. The United States did not invent the concept of unlawful enemy combatants to put people into a legal black hole. The distinction between lawful and unlawful combatants has deep roots in international humanitarian law. It can be traced back to the Hague regulations of 1899 and 1907. Moreover, as a matter of law, Al-Qaeda and Taliban detainees are not entitled to prisoner of war status. The Third Geneva Convention does not ensure that everyone who takes up weapons on a battlefield automatically receives POW status. In fact, the bulk of Third Convention protections, including POW status, are limited to belligerents engaged in an international armed conflict. The U.S. Supreme Court's Hamdan decision reflects that the conflict between the United States and Al-Qaeda is not an international armed conflict, which means that captured Al-Qaeda fighters are not entitled to POW protections. While we are in an international armed conflict with the Taliban, which was the effective government of a party to the Geneva Conventions, they did not meet third Con Geneva Convention requirements because their fighters did not carry their arms openly, wear a uniform recognizable at a distance, or respect the laws and customs of war, which are all of the conditions required for POW status in Article 4 of the third Geneva Convention. Some have argued that even if the Taliban and Al-Qaeda are not entitled to POW status as a matter of law, the United States should grant them POW status as a matter of policy. In fact, U.S. policymakers seriously considered doing this in 2002, but ultimately rejected this approach because they concluded it would not serve the purposes of the Geneva Conventions to give POW status to a group responsible for the slaughter of thousands of civilians in disregard of the laws of war. The Third Convention creates a compact for those engaged in international armed conflict. Engage lawfully in combat, and if you're captured, you will receive comprehensive treatment protection. But if you ignore your legal obligations and you ignore the laws of war, you will not be entitled to those same protections. POW status can thus be seen as an incentive to follow the rules. Weaken that incentive, and the losers would not only be our own soldiers, but civilians who bear the brunt of suffering when unlawful combatants operate surreptitiously within the general population. Our decision to try these unlawful combatants before military commissions has also been roundly criticized. But when our critics see how the recently signed Military Commissions Act work in practice, I believe they'll realize that it offers an appropriate framework for these trials. The Act provides all the fundamental guarantees of fairness and due process and addresses many concerns expressed by the international community with the President's earlier executive order. For example, the accused will have an unqualified right to hear all the evidence against them, and they may appeal their convictions all the way to the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, for some, 
any form of military justice carries a whiff of summary justice. The United States, however, has a long and honorable tradition of military justice that's worthy of respect in both its design and its functioning. Just look at the zealous advocacy of those military lawyers assigned to defend Guantanamo detainees. In countries like Germany, however, where there is no comparable tradition of military justice, the image of a kangaroo court is hard to shake. Finally, one area in which we've seen a difference in approach between the United States and Europe is in how each balances state security and personal privacy. As the US government increasingly looks for technological means of improving counterterrorism defenses, such as building up electronic databases, foreign calls to protect data privacy have grown. In recent years, many Europeans traveling to the United States have become alarmed at our government's increasing demands for personal information. This conflict has played out most noticeably in difficult negotiations between the United States and the European Union in 2004 and again this year over our requirement that airlines electronically supply the Department of Homeland Security with extensive data, so-called passenger name records, on all arriving international travelers. There are genuine differences between the underlying American and European legal regimes for protecting personal privacy. European Union member states have highly formal and codified systems grounded in comprehensive laws presided over by independent data protection commissioners. In particular, they limit the access of private firms to personal data, something we probably wish we all did. In the United States, though, privacy protections are more diffuse and decentralized, comprising a patchwork, a flexible common law of privacy made up of constitutional, statutory, and regulatory provisions. Other than medical records, we do not systematically and comprehensively regulate the efforts of private firms to acquire personal data. We also have no tradition of data protection commissioners or czars. Ironically, however, in some areas, Europeans appear more willing to accept intrusions on their privacy than we do. For example, Britons submit to widespread video surveillance of public places, and Europeans universally carry national identity cards, something that does not ex exist and is abhorrent, in fact, in the United States, where even proposals to standardize state driver's licenses meet with widespread anxiety. But despite our differences, we've worked out mutually acceptable transatlantic privacy protections in the counterterrorism context. In 2002, an agreement was reached for sharing personal data between US law enforcement agencies, such as the FBI and its new European counterpart, the European Police Agency. In 2003, the United States and the EU concluded historic agreements on mutual legal assistance in criminal matters and on extradition, regulating, among other things, the terms for sharing personal data needed for use in criminal proceedings in the other's territories. Just last week, an agreement was signed with Eurojust, a new EU organization responsible for coordinating serious transborder criminal proceedings, which will provide an enhanced basis for transatlantic prosecutorial cooperation. Even the sensitive question of sharing passenger name records has been successfully settled between the United States and the EU, reassuring European passengers that their personal information is being safeguarded while giving the Department of Homeland Security a valuable tool for keeping terrorists and other criminals from our shores. And now a more ambitious effort is in the offing, the development of a framework agreement to govern this all. At a meeting in Washington on November 6th, Attorney General Gonzalez and Secretary of Homeland Security Chertoff and their European counterparts commissioned senior experts from their ministries and from the State Department 
to examine whether a wide-ranging agreement would be possible in the law enforcement and border security areas. The fact that this initiative is being taken up shows that in this particular area, American and European approaches to protecting privacy are coming together rather than moving apart. All of these areas of legal controversy underscore the timeliness of creating a center devoted to international and comparative law. Let me presume upon your hospitality to offer just a couple of my hopes about what this center might become. First, I'm confident that under Kurt Bradley's leadership, the center will address an unfortunate isolationist tendency in contemporary US international and comparative law teaching and scholarship. This isolationism is not from the rest of the world, but rather from the rest of the legal education enterprise. Too often, international and comparative law has been an elective in our law school curriculum. A cultural detour from core subjects such as constitutional law, federal courts, administrative law, property, and contracts. And as a result, international and comparative law neither get as much respect as they deserve, nor face the kind of bracing examination through the same methodological tools and intellectual discipline and energy that's brought to bear on other law school subjects. To make clear its relevance to all facets of legal training, the disciplines of international and comparative law must incorporate the rigor, creativity, and focus that we see in our domestic subjects. Kurt's own scholarship stands as a wonderful example of how to integrate international and foreign law with the study of the US Constitution and federal courts system. Second, I hope that this center will break down the isolation of international and comparative law by encouraging teachers of all law school courses to draw on foreign and international examples and experience. For example, courses in criminal law and criminal procedure could explore the rules and methods of continental Europe to illustrate plausible alternatives to our approach. The same point applies to every subject in the regular law school curriculum. We Americans need to get past the unstated assumption that the accomplishments of our own legal system are unique and superior. Studying the achievements as well as the failures of others can illuminate our own. Third, I hope the center will expand the opportunities to work with and learn from our foreign colleagues. Faculty and student exchanges can turn book learning about foreign law into something that's vivid and concrete. More foreign faculty and students mean greater opportunity for joint research and discussion, both inside and outside the classroom. Such collaborations not only educate the rest of the world about the best qualities of the United States, our enduring commitment to the rule of law and ordered liberty, but enrich our own understanding. I also hope that this center can encourage Duke faculty and Duke students to work and study in foreign countries. And in closing, let me say that I am grateful to you and particularly to Kurt for allowing me to take part in this inauguration of the center. I look forward to learning from your work. And in particular, I look forward to having as colleagues uh, in my office of the legal advisor at the State Department lawyers whom this center and this law school have touched and made better. Thank you very much. And I think we have left some time for questioning, which is the part that I really enjoy. So I'm open for questions. Mr. Bellinger has kindly agreed to take questions. And I think we have about 15 minutes. So we should be able to get a number of questions in. I see, uh, among other things, students from international law. So you probably heard a lot of topics that we've talked about in class. I also wanted to mention that uh, he's kindly agreed to meet with students later today at 4.15 in the Birdman Lounge to talk more about career issues, particularly in government. So there'll be other opportunities, hopefully, to interact with him later today. Uh, yeah, Jeff. Um, I think a lot of us will agree with the idea that cautious uh, consent coupled with stringent enforcement is a good thing. Um, and it's, it shows a respect for international law more than 
uh, quick consent and loose enforcement would. Um, I was wondering though if you could comment on the lead up to the Iraq war. Um, there, was a, there was a question about uh, whether or not further resolution was going to be needed in order to uh, justify the use of force. In my mind, it's, we didn't use that same caution. Um, and in fact, when we failed to uh, find a n nine votes on the Security Council, we tended to act unilaterally. Um, is that different? Is there something different about that um, that action? Um, that something that justifies that different action? It's, uh, it's a good question, which proves my point. If I had had longer to talk, which you would not have wanted me to do, I would have actually used this as an example. Because the, the litany, there's sort of a standard mantra that I hear about the US not uh, you know, taking international law seriously. We didn't sign up to Kyoto. We didn't sign up to the Rome Statute. We'd have ignored the Geneva Conventions. We went to war in Iraq without a legal justification. Uh, and the Iraq war, perfect example. We had a very clear legal uh, justification that had been being used for 10, 12 years by administrations of both parties, uh, which was that previous UN Security Council resolutions, which ended the first Gulf War, stated that the, uh, there, there was essentially a ceasefire uh, in 1991, but that if Iraq breached its obligations under that ceasefire, the original use of force authorization continued. Now, that had been being relied upon for 10 years. The uh, entire theory of the no-fly zones, both under the first Bush administration, the Clinton administration, and this Bush administration, we would not have had authority to use force to enforce the no-fly zones if there was not legal authority uh, to use force. So uh, for 10 years, we had been relying on this legal rationale, really without much objection from anybody else. Uh, I mean, of course, people objected to the Iraq war, I mean, that's, an, that's ob uh, obvious. But it was really a policy difference. And your point is, should we have gone and gotten another resolution? You know, that's a f very fair policy point. Should people have worked harder to try to do that? Fair policy debate. Uh, but to say that it was illegal because we didn't go seek another, policy, uh, another resolution, I think is wrong when there was clear legal authority under which we'd been operating. In the white shirt? Yes. Um, actually, if, if you were to justify uh, invasion in Iraq under the doctrine of reprisal, you will have to make a factual determination of whether Iraq was compliant with its obligations. And, and I don't think that uh, under the circumstances, uh, uh, the trial of the facts should have been any one country, be it the United States or EU, since the initial um, authorization of the use of force uh, was ad adopted collectively by the Security Council. There should um, the security. The Security Council should have been the trial of fact in, in the question of compliance. Yep, I understand your point. Um, the, and, and I would say that they were, uh, in that in Resolution 1441, which was the resolution that was adopted before the Iraq War, uh, that, that was the important legal basis going forward because in 1441 the Security Council did find collectively that Iraq was in material breach of its obligations under UN Security Council resolutions. And that's why there was such a fuss and fight over uh, 1441 because the Security Council members knew exactly what they were doing that if they in fact collectively found that Iraq was in material breach of its obligations, that that in fact uh, would re-trigger uh, the, uh, the 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 former authorities from Resolution 678 and 687 from the from the first Gulf War. So it was not that just the United States, w on its own, decided that Iraq was uh, not in compliance with its obligations. The Security Council as a whole found Iraq is in material breach. Uh, and again, you know, you can have these policy differences, but it was not that we went to war 
without a legal justification. I mean, I can tell you from the point of view of the State Department, uh, you know, this had been the, the long-standing legal theory that, uh, that had been relied on through both administrations. Inclusion of Taliban as unlawful combatants in the military commissions act. Under both the military commissions act and the um, prisoner of war convention, lawful combatants become POWs of protection. That's, that's uncontroversial and it's true of both, but unlawful combatants don't get POWs of protection. Lawful combatants who are nationals of countries who are party to the Geneva Conventions. Article 2 of the Geneva Convention says the conventions apply between high contracting parties. And so your view of the Taliban, all the Taliban fighters being considered unlawful combatants and therefore not to a W rest on the party status of Afghanistan at that time relative to Geneva Convention? No, I mean this was the harder argument. The um, Al-Qaeda could not possibly have been a, and you know, that's why the Supreme Court didn't even, as we say, they didn't even go there, because Al-Qaeda, not a party to the Geneva Conventions, which are treaties between countries. Um, the Taliban were the, while you could potentially argue otherwise, and some people argued otherwise, the Taliban were arguably, and we concluded, the, the national army of a party, Afghanistan. Uh, uh, but then you had to continue to read through the rest of the convention. So that got a good raised eyebrow at me, Madam. <laughs> the, uh, the article, article, so Article Two of the Convention says applies between high contracting parties, U.S. and Afghanistan high contracting parties. Then you get to Article Four, which says doesn't just say anybody who is a high contracting, a, a, a national of a high contracting party, then is a POW. It then says prisoners of war are people who fit those definitions. So uh, part of a national army. Yes, a part of a national army, carry arms openly, uniforms recognizable at a different distance, and follow the laws and customs of war. And this makes sense in that, you know, if you are simply a part of a, a national of a signing party, uh, but you flagrantly ignore all of the laws and customs of war, uh, and then you, know, you, you have undermined the incentive structure for the Geneva Conventions. And it's, it's we think, quite clear from the commentaries uh, that you don't just automatically get POW status. Essentially, you comport yourself like a gentleman soldier, and then you get uh, a POW status. We can talk afterwards. I'm going to get some of the students, too. Um, yeah, way in the back. Right. Um, the, they are being held uh, as uh, combatants who were uh, as part of our war with Al Qaeda and the Taliban. And it's, this is a good, it's important to look at where we got from. I mean, people look now at this slice and they say, this is an unhappy situation. These people are being held, have been held for five years. What's their prospect, particularly if they're not going to be tried? makes us all uncomfortable. I mean, I'll have to say it makes me uncomfortable. Um, on the other hand, uh, you have to look back along each step of the way. Uh, the United States went into Afghanistan with its allies to use force to defend ourselves, uh, and consistent with the UN Security Council resolution that said that we could act in Afghanistan. The people who were picked up there were not picked up as part of a police action, uh, but as part of a use of force to clear Al Qaeda out of Afghanistan. So if you look your way through the decision tree, I guess one could say, well, when we were in Afghanistan, even if we were acting uh, lawfully to knock out these Al Qaeda training camps, maybe we shouldn't have picked anyone up at all. But then, you know, think that through. Do you say, all right, it's going to be difficult if we detain, detain people, uh, we'll just sort of push everybody aside, all these people from 30 different countries. Um, and you're probably not going to say that. So you're going to say, all right, it was all right to pick up some people. Now, we weren't just picking people up against whom there was an arrest warrant. All of our soldiers in Afghanistan w working through these Al Qaeda training camps did not have a, a list of people who could be picked up. They were essentially picked up people who were fighting us, 
uh, or who were escaping over the mountains in Afghanistan. So we were rightly holding these people uh, uh, who we detained. The question then is, is, did the war end at a certain point that required us to uh, turn them over? Now you can make an argument that in the middle of 2002, when the Karzai government took over, uh, that the war ended. You can make that argument, but I think if you were to talk to Mr. Karzai and watching you know, hundreds of Afghans being killed every day and Taliban continuing to fight, that the war very much looks like it's ongoing. You know, same with Al Qaeda. You know, they keep sending messages to us saying we're continuing to fight you. So the short answer to your question is, well, I guess that's a long answer to your question, uh, is we detained these people as as combatants in a lawful war in 2001 to 2002, and we think that the war with both the Taliban and Al Qaeda is ongoing. And in any kind of traditional war, and admittedly this is not terribly traditional but it is a traditional legal principle, we can hold people until the end of those hostilities. Uh, so here? Oh, sorry. Uh, I can't see that far back. So. Okay. Um, you mentioned that part of the reason why the United States was hesitant to join the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction was because of the, the hollow tradition of checks and balances in the United States and our belief in that system. But when the United States doesn't engage in an international such as that, or international court crime, where do you see the United States being checked or balancing the interests of what the United States does with other international bodies if we don't agree or consent to their jurisdiction? Well, we, remember, the ICC is based on a system of complementarity. It is essentially ascended, it, it intended to be a backup or safety net criminal justice system to complement the criminal justice systems of different countries. So that in places like Yugoslavia or Rwanda or uh, Liberia, uh, where there were war crimes, uh, atrocities, human rights violations, and those countries' criminal justice systems were not able to prosecute people, we set up ad hoc tribunals, which the United States has been uh, provided more funding than any country in the world, half a billion dollars. The idea of the ICC was to make a permanent ad hoc tribunal, but again, to complement the criminal justice systems of individual countries. The United States has a uh, effective uh, criminal justice system. We have prosecuted, we've investigated hundreds and hundreds of our soldiers and our, uh, and even intelligence officials uh, for possible abuses, and as you know, many of them uh, have been prosecuted uh, and convicted. So. Uh, the, there is a, uh, a, a system that works in the United States. Now, obviously, your larger point is, if the United States doesn't sign up to something like the ICC, you know, what sort of a signal is that to the rest of the world? You know, it's a problem. We, we worked very hard uh, uh, to negotiate the ICC, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, other countries essentially sort of left us behind by refusing to acknowledge the differences of, of the United States. The United States is uniquely at risk because we are the only country in the world that has our servicemen and women all around the world stationed in different countries, engaged in peacekeeping operations. So we are uniquely at risk of people who will uh, bring politicized prosecutions. And that's unfortunately the world we live in, and that's simply why we had wanted a Security Council check on the bringing of prosecutions. Uh, Scott. Scott Silver, you articulated the language theory 1441 as a legal predicate for Iraq. In 2006, our national security strategy, as was in 2004 or 2002, we also embrace and articulate the doctrine of preemption. In, in your view, will we continue to embrace preemption as an ultimate? Predicate for Security Council authorization. The you know, we we explained. Secretary Rice actually gave a very good talk about this. The uh, in the original national security strategy, uh, there were a lot of things that were new, like support for democracy and freedom around the world. 
The one thing that really wasn't new, but that got all of the press, was the doctrine of preemption, with people saying, oh my god, this is a terrible new theory. The United States is going to go and preempt uh, around the world. This is really just a shorthand for, for those of you who have taken international law of the age-old theory of anticipatory self-defense that's long been accepted, going back to Grotius, uh, that one can act to uh, preempt a armed attack before it happens. Uh, and uh, the, we simply were saying, and Dr. Rice explained this in a long address that she gave after the uh, national security strategy was given at, um, I've forgotten where she gave it, but it was uh, it explained this in more legal detail, uh, that in the nuclear age, the only thing that's really different from the traditional theory of anticipatory self-defense where you sort of waited for the ships to be in your harbor or the soldiers to be on your border, at that point it's a little bit too late if the nuclear weapon is sort of launched. You, 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 it has to be a little longer distance. So, you know, we are simply saying as a political matter, you have to uh, nip terrorism or, uh, or uh, threats like this in the bud. But I think the theory, the legal theory, is the same one of anticipatory self-defense that's been relied on for generations. Okay. Uh, I wish we had more time. I can see a number of people who want to ask additional questions, but we uh, need to break it at one fifteen. As I mentioned, Mr. Bellinger has kindly agreed to meet with students later this afternoon at 4.15, so I hope you can uh, make that, and uh, there may be a little bit of time right afterward, including if you want to talk with uh, the legal advisor. I uh, hope you, like me, appreciate the, both the wide-ranging and very thoughtful talk, and as you can see, a willingness to en engage with and answer uh, very difficult and controversial uh, questions and issues. And so we uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, and I'm... I am happy when we get together later on. If you want to take, talk substance, we can talk substance. What I really enjoy doing uh, is, is sitting down and talking about careers in government, and particularly in national security or international law. So for those of you who are contemplating careers in those areas, uh, please come, and uh, you can throw in your questions about Iraq and detainees as well. Thanks. Thanks, John. It was great. Yeah. It's terrific and very educational. The, your, your definition of... Uh...